What's up everyone, Vu of Envu Films, back with another video. And today, I'm being a typical deadbeat Asian father by working to make $3 with this YouTube video while trying to watch my son run around. At the corner of my eyes, peripheral vision, thankfully I'm Asian, so I have wide angle anamorphic lens so I could see what he's doing at all times. With that being said, in order to do that, I have to film outside here in my kitchen and my house is my house is hardwood floors tall ceilings whatever you want to call it so there's a lot of reverb which is why i'm holding this microphone right up in my face uh at least i have decent reason for it and not just doing it to look like a podcast or something and unfortunately this particular mic i'm using this kamika vm30 doesn't come with a uh, standard foam, so it only has this dead cat, or in this case, looks like a dead squirrel from the local Chinese food restaurant. Today, I want to talk about YouTube reviews and the issues I have with it that most YouTubers have not really covered yet, and I have not covered yet. Um, I think it's pretty well known if you have subscribed to my channel that I always make fun of um, sponsored reviews and, you know, the typical YouTube douchebaggery, tube doucher content that we know and love here, especially here on the camera space. And you have seen other creators talk about Insta360 issues and you've seen Gerald Undone talk about the issues with the Panasonic S9 Tokyo trip. Japan trip, whatever it was. And you know, that's well known, right? So like, I don't think the vast majority of people need to be told that. Uh, I think a lot of times the way YouTubers review stuff, you could automatically see that they're feeding you bullshit. They're feeding you things that has been paid for. The words they are speaking out of their mouth have been paid for. I'm not saying every YouTuber does this, but I've noticed some YouTubers are more willing to do this. And, you know, it's easy to find hatred in that because they're being dishonest or whatever. But to be clear, that's just how it is, okay? Marketing in this capitalist uh, world, especially here in America, it is what it is. People always, brands are always trying to upsell you, sell you things you don't need, lie to you about whatever, or just, you know, just use a bunch of tactics that is pretty much proven by science because most human beings, their brains operate the exact same. Stop it, Jackson, get out of there. Because most human beings, their brains operate at the same wavelength pretty much. So it is very easy for marketing companies to figure out how to manipulate that. It's just how it works. It's just how most brands make a lot of money, small businesses, whatever you want to call it. This is how you, this is how you lure customers in to pay for your goods and services. You need to be able to sift through what is just pure marketing, what is pure opinion from a particular YouTuber content creator, what is pure, um, and what is just pure outright lies uh, and just bullshittery just to get clicks. So speaking about you know, the human mind and how it works. There's another thing that you have to watch out for is brand loyalty. I think it's pretty clear that most tube douchers, content creators, they align themselves with a certain brand, not out of sponsorship, not out of money, but out of the fact that that's the brand that they use. That's the brand that they invested money in. In my case, those of you who subscribe to my channel know that I'm a Sony douchebag fanboy. And I kind of say that jokingly because, yes, I'm a fan of Sony because I enjoy using their cameras, their lenses. Um, but at the same time, I use the third-party lenses. You're talking about Sigma, Tamron, Viltrox, whatever. I use, I try all of them, I own them. So when I started tinkering when I started tinkering with cameras back in 2014 I bought a Sony camera because it was an affordable option compared to like Canon at the time based on the specs 1080 you know I was able to get uh, APS-C Sony 
a6000 or sony nex6 with 1080p 60 and the canon I don't know, 5D Mark II or whatever it was, couldn't even do 1080, 60. It was like 720, 60p. So for me, it was obvious to get the cheaper camera that could do a higher quality video. Ever since then, as time progressed, Sony has never disappointed me to the point where I had to leave the system. I think a lot of times we leave systems to try uh, new things, but really, we could have produced the same level of work staying on the system that we already had. So the, f the closest I've gotten to switching to another system was trying out Fujifilm X-T3, X-T4 to be able to use 10-bit 422 uh, and, you know, shooting log to like try to color grade better um, because Sony at the time, the Sony A7S III hasn't been released yet. So there was no 10-bit available there was no 10-bit 4K60 available for me to toy around with with Sony. But while I was trying out the X-T3, X-T4 from Fujifilm, I'd never switched entirely out of Sony. I just kept all my Sony stuff and I used my Sony cameras with my Fujifilm um, camera, you know? So, so like if I went to film a wedding, I would use the main camera as my, the Fujifilm and the Sony cameras would be the angles. When you look at me, you could call me a Sony fanboy, you could call me whatever, but the reality is I would be willing to switch over to a different system as soon as something just comes out that is mind-blowingly better than the Sony, um, you know, and it works with me in terms of budget, um, specs, uh, lenses available, the whole nine yard size, weight, whatever. Um, and when Sony does do something dumb, or, you know, slow on releasing something, you're gonna, I'm always criticizing them. I criticize them with firmware updates for the Sony A7S III. I criticized them back in the day for not coming out with the Sony A7S III when they did. I criticize them for questionable lenses that they come out with. The whole nine yards, you know, there's no perfect camera system out there for everyone. But right now, the Sony system is perfect for me or as close to perfect for me as possible. With that said, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm like super trustworthy either because you could go back a year from now, look up some of my videos and I'm telling you, okay, this tripod is the best tripod, but today my opinion has completely changed. So regardless if I was a YouTube douchebag trash or not, I would be testing out, trying out different gear all the time because I just like it. I'm just, you know, one of those dudes. I'm a gearhead. I like trying out different things and my mind continuously changes on things. And I allow it to because I don't want to be closing off my mind on one thing. My mind to crystallize on any certain subject because then that limits my growth. Just as Bruce Lee said, style is like a crystallization. Like you don't want to have like something specific that you're holding on to so tight that it doesn't allow you to step out of that and learn different things to grow. So unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Like. Even things that I'm telling you today, maybe like two months from now, my mind will change on it. And then all of a sudden I'm going to come out with a different video and you may say that, oh, Vu, you're being contradictory. But you know what? Like at the time, when a year ago, when I told you a certain tripod was the best one, that is how I truly felt about it. And right now, today, I feel 100% that everything that is coming out of my mouth is truth in terms of my opinion, um, how I'm feeling, whatever. But all because my mind changes next week doesn't mean today I'm just lying to you, if that makes sense. So back to like brand loyalty, the it's scary if you have to deal with bias based on dudes getting paid by brands to say certain things um, or, or not say certain things, um, you know, trash brands like Insta360. And then... It's kind of scary also is when dudes have an inherent bias, even though the company's not paying them anything, it's just because they themselves has invested a lot of money into a particular camera or system or gear, and they are trying to justify to themselves why they bought it. And then they may say things out of opinion as if it's fact, and they end up influence you to make the same decision they did when it might not be the best decision for you, let's say to buy like a certain camera or whatever. So 
those are things you have to look out for. Like if my, if, for example, you know, if I talk about Sony gear in a certain way and you see that my style and how I approach filming and all that stuff aligns with you and you feel like the way I work and what I'm saying fits with the way you work and, you know, how you want to do things, then you could probably rely on what I'm telling you a bit more. But at the same time, like when I state my opinion on something, I always try to tell you what my opinion is. So it's like, in my opinion, Sony has the best autofocus system. Honestly, it's good. It's, it's great for the, way, for the way I work, for the way I do things. But, you know, Canon has a great autofocus system. Nikon, I think, is having a great autofocus system. Panasonic has, you know, uh, phase detect autofocus now. So maybe if someone goes out there and tests all these cameras with the same exact lens somehow, uh, with the same exact everything, and we could say that, okay, the one camera is better autofocus than another, but can you really, you can't really do a perfect test because you can't um, fairly test the same lens, right? You can't just grab a G Master lens and put it on the Panasonic L mount. You know, and then let's say you have an adapter, that adapter is not going to be as reliable as a direct mount to like the Sony E-mount. So, I mean, there's L-mount lenses, but then like all because those L-mounts, you know, 50 millimeter, let's say it's slower on the Sony and faster than the Panasonic, but then you could always buy 50 millimeter G master lens and that 50 millimeter G master lens is going to be faster autofocusing than the L-mount on the Panasonic. So then how do you figure which one is the better autofocus system? You can't. So that's just my opinion. Then another thing too, color science, right? A lot of bullshit has been thrown out there over the years with Canon. Everyone knows about Canon color science bullshit. Now people are starting to say, oh, Panasonic has great color science. Color science is completely subjective. So if there's a dude out there just like throwing out that, oh, this camera is the best color science, it is an opinion. You know, it is not 100% concrete fact. Fact would be to me more like, what has the most accurate color science, you know? I don't like straight out of the camera colors, so like whatever is built into the camera, like I don't really care for. I always want to shoot and log and like mess around with the colors to my preference. But, you know, if straight out of camera colors is your thing, you're going there and, you know, that is your preference of camera color. You know, that is your particular, if you like, Panasonic straight out of camera colors, that is your preference. If someone says that they like, they love uh, Canon straight out of camera colors, that is their particular preference. But that is not absolute fact that it has the best color signs. Um, and then some people say Sony has horrible color signs, right? There's dudes out there, fans from other camera brands on YouTube talking shit, talking about how like Sony color science sucks. Meanwhile, and I don't want to sit here and bring up like the creator, you know, for the billion time about the Sony FX3 and all that stuff. But the producers, director, colorists and stuff of the creator, one of the reasons why they decided to pick the Sony FX3 for that film was because they loved the color signs. So I'm looking at like these Hollywood filmmakers making $80 million movie saying the Sony FX3 has great color science. And then I'm looking at these YouTube D-bag trash on their internet, filming this video in their mom's basement, right? You know, in between appointments to inject them with puberty blockers. They are saying that the, is, they are saying the color science of Sony is bad. Who am I going to listen to? Am I going to listen to the Hollywood director colorists or am I going to listen to this, this dude who literally the only experience of filming anything is, you know, vlogging about their gender transition on TikTok. That is their extent of um, their filming expertise. You tell me, you know, where all that is. So I think there's a test out there was testing which camera brand had the most accurate color science, and I believe it was Sony. Look it up, um, don't you know? take my word on it. But 
again, this is gonna come out like I'm sounding biased right here, but this is just how I feel about stuff. Let's say I'm a painter, I'm gonna want to start off on the whitest of white canvases, like pure white canvas. I do not want an off-white, you know, slightly yellowed canvas. I don't want like a white canvas with a slight hint of magenta. I just want this white canvas to be completely white before I start painting on it. You know, I want to manipulate the colors 100%, you know, and based on that, I just want the colors to be accurate to start off with, and then I could get the colors to where I want it to be. So you have to separate opinions from fact, and obviously fact from opinion. So then you're gonna look at, what do I mean by like facts? Okay, someone is gonna come out there and tell you, um, let's, say, let's say someone out there is gonna tell you, the uh, Panasonic S5 Mark II X is better than the Sony FX3. Is it really? Okay, so before I even like start throwing out specs, this, that, and the other, whatever. If you had a choice, right? You go to the store and you see a Panasonic S5 Mark II X for $2,000. And then right next to it is a Sony FX3 for $2,000. And you look at both sides, the specs, whatever. The whole camera system, every the whole uh, ecosystem and all that stuff. Are you really going to buy the Panasonic S5 Mark II X over the Sony FX3? I would think that 90% of you at least is going to buy the Sony FX3. The other 10% is one high on crack cocaine, fentanyl, or whatever the kids are into these days drunk on straight Bud Light, you know, probably had to drink 20 of them and, you know, also, you know, inject yourself with hormones for the other gender. I don't know what you're on, but if you are buying the Panasonic S5 Mark II X over the Sony FX3, if they were priced exactly the same, you have brain damage, you know what I mean, uh, to be kind about it. Same thing as if you bought a Sony FX3 instead of an Ari Alexa, if they were the same exact price, you know. Honestly, the hard decision for me in that regard is that if the value of the Ari Alexa was that low and there was no benefit to me of reselling it for 100K, I mean, I might for my use, end up buying the Sony FX3 because it has autofocus. And here is where my personal preferences go get in the way of like true fact of which is the better thing to buy because I'm gonna have a lot of trouble shooting like a wedding with an Ari Alexa. You know what I mean? I'm gonna have a lot of problem taking an Ari Alexa around with my family to film my children um, on vacations. You know what I mean? Like it's it's just not, it's not good for that use because one is bigger, you have to like rig it out and you have to manual focus and all that stuff. So, I mean, that's just like hypothetical, right? That is completely hypothetical stuff, but you know, that's my decision to make at the end of the day uh, and based on how I'm shooting. But like, you know, human beings are very tribal when it comes to a lot of things, right? Take cameras. Everyone is gonna be like, oh, Canon's the best, Sony's the best, Nikon's the best, Panasonic is the best. Uh, I don't know, Olympus, whatever the hell people are shooting on. And then you look at cars, right? Trucks. Oh, Toyota Tacoma is the best. No, no, like uh, Ford Ranger. Oh, no, you know, Chevy Colorado. In my case, I've owned a 2022 Nissan Frontier. You know, as a person who's really into cars, like it's, it's like this all over the place. You know, like when I owned Subaru Impreza, WRX, STIs and stuff like that. It was always Subaru. Oh no, it's Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution is better. Oh no, freaking uh, Ford Focus ST, Ford Focus RS, you know, whatever at the time, you know, there's always like these tribal like rivalries, you know, as if it was like sports teams where you're talking about freaking, you know, I'm a Washington Commanders fan. I'm in the Washington, D.C. area. Of course, I'm not going to like the Dallas Cowboys, Philadelphia Eagles, and New York Giants. It's just, it's just how it is, right? 
but that's like a football team. You're rooting for like your, the area, the community that you live in, right? Your home team. But when it comes to like brands on products, like that's not, people shouldn't do that kind of stuff. You know, you buy what is best for you at the time and particular technical facts about the camera. And then some of the opinions is just based on your own personal preference, right? For me, with Sony, with me with Sony, it's size, lens selection, autofocus. And then when it comes down to like facts is that the FX3 is the only camera out there that could do full frame, 4K60, 4K120, 10-bit 422, all the way through 120 frames per second, 4K at a 1.1 crop, which is slightly, ever so slightly less than full frame, a lot more than APS-C, which is the next biggest sensor size, with audio, with 10-bit 422, the whole nine yards. It's the only camera that can do that under $4,000. If you're trying to get into cameras, right, and you're trying to find a camera to buy, and your budget is like four grand, and you see a video where a dude says, oh, the Panasonic S5 Mark II X is better than the Sony FX3. You need to look at like facts, you know? You go in and you look at the specs and you see that the Panasonic S5 Mark II X cannot do 4K60 with the full frame of the sensor. It only does it in APS-C mode, which is cropped in, which means that 24 millimeter lens that you currently have on that camera is gonna be a 35 millimeter lens and it's gonna completely jack up your composition. And then you're gonna have to figure that out, switch things out. You know, the bokeh is not gonna be exactly the same because now you're gonna have to back out further, whatever, right? Your low light capability is not gonna be the same because you're only using part of the sensor. Full frame sensor is gonna have better low light, so your low light is not gonna be the same. Then when you go back to the full frame sensor of the Panasonic S5 Mark IIs, you're gonna have to deal with rolling shutter if you're moving, you're trying you know, moving around fast moving subjects, you're gonna see all these wavy lines or whatever. It's basically the same thing as the a7 IV. The a7 IV is like $1,500 cheaper than the FX3. If someone told me that, hey, the S5 Mark II X is better than the a7 IV, that is more acceptable to me, right? It definitely has better like things for video. But then when you go to photo, obviously you have 33 megapixels, a7 IV, just faster overall processing, whatever, then you're gonna have like a toss up between the two cameras, right? But I have a7 IV, which is actually the true competitor to the S5 Mark II X, or maybe even the FX30, which I also have, is can be seen as a competitor to the S5 Mark II X to be able to use most of its higher frame rates. You're gonna have to, uh, again, you're gonna have to crop in and the FX30 is already a crop sensor camera. So I own the FX30 a7 IV, I would never pick those two cameras over using my FX3 for the vast majority of video product pro projects because FX3 is just a better camera for video than both of those. There's no question about it. So, you know, if for some reason you need open gate or whatever, I could see you buying the um, Panasonic S5 Mark II X. But to me, things like open gate, uh, you know, different different aspect ratios, you know, available, like whatever other monitoring aspects that the Panasonic S5 Mark II X that for some reason Sony FX3 doesn't have. Those type of specs doesn't have as large of an effect in terms of the capabilities of the camera for the user, in my opinion. Again, this is my opinion, not complete fact because I'm kind of talking out of my own personal preference right now. It's not gonna have as large of an effect on me because I don't really care much for open gate for the things that I'm filming, right? That's one. And when I'm filming, I've used Sony for so long now that I produce my own LUTs that I put, you know, onto my camera. It's for me to monitor what the image looks like. So I don't necessarily need all like these charts and everything all over the place because my LUT has been designed specifically for me to know that the image is well exposed and I know exactly what I'm gonna get just from that um, in post and all that stuff. So it's not much for me to have to like, there's not much guesswork for me to do. Saying, to me saying like a lot of these, a lot of these little nitty gritty things the Panasonic S5 Mark II X can do, 
versus what the FX3 can do. It's as if you're saying that Justin Herbert is better than Patrick Mahomes. Okay. If, if Patrick Mahomes with the FX3 and then Justin Herbert is a Panasonic X Smart Mark 2X, sure, Justin Herbert might be able to do some things better than Patrick Mahomes. Maybe he has a better throwing form. Remember, maybe he has better uh, accuracy sitting in the pocket. Maybe he can read, maybe he does a better job of reading defenses or whatever. That doesn't mean he's better than Patrick Mahomes because Patrick Mahomes has won multiple Super Bowls. Dude could make ridiculous plays when he's getting pressured, you know, out of pocket, throws at various different angles. Like the overall better quarterback is Patrick Mahomes, you know, and maybe Patrick Mahomes can do 4K 60 full frame, 4K 120, uh, you know, dynamic range or whatever. And, and unfortunately, a lot of YouTubers out there do not know what the hell they are talking about. You're not going to see me coming on here talking about working on set with a camera crew. You know, I have no business talking about that. I have never experienced that before. I can only speak on my personal experience on things, my own personal research on things. So I'm not sitting here trying to tell you that my judgment is 100% correct all the time. But personally, when I like watch reviews on stuff and I decide, I'm the type of person who doesn't rent stuff. I don't really try things out. I don't, like when I bought my truck and stuff, I didn't go for a test drive first. I watch a bunch of reviews and I know I'm, I'm going to like it. I know I'm going to buy that. I'm going to enjoy it. And 99% of the time, I'm exactly right. Just went to, bought my truck, went to go pick it up. I just drove around, make sure everything wasn't like rattling, make sure everything's good. And I just drove, it was exactly what I expected to be based on reviews. Lenses, I see, I watched like 10, 20 videos on it. And I'm thinking, okay, this lens is probably gonna be like this. So I think it's okay to buy, I buy it. And the lens is exactly how I think it's gonna be. Insta 360 cameras, I watched videos. I thought it was trash. I would never buy it. And then lo and behold, YouTubers coming out now telling everyone that Insta360 paying them and telling them not to say certain things on a YouTube video. So I hope what you're getting from this video here is that question every review you watch, whether it be on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, question all of these things. Everyone is out there trying to make a dollar. And literally me out, I'm literally trying to make a dollar. I'm gonna make one buck out of this video. Currently, my goal for my YouTube channel is to grow it and to make decent amount of money from ad revenue, things of that nature, without necessarily trying to directly sell you guys anything. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying, I'm trying to make decent money from YouTube without having to take on sponsorships. I've been offered 500 bucks and stuff like that to, you know, do like one to two minute reads on this channel about a certain product or brand. And I declined it, or not necessarily I didn't decline, I said, okay, I'll do it, but then I never did it yet because I don't know how I'm supposed to talk about this product that I don't use and that I don't really see the value of it in my, for myself. Sure, if I see the value it for you, know, you guys out there, maybe I could say something. I just have trouble talking about stuff and recommending something that I do not use myself. It is tough. I, I can criticize things that I do not use because obviously there's a reason why I don't use it. So I could have criticisms, but I don't want to say anything, you know, talk and endorse something that I don't personally use on my own. You know, don't get, don't get tricked. Don't get scammed out by uh, some of these YouTube reviews out there. Um, yeah, that's about it for today. Long ass video for no freaking reason. But uh, again, if you found this video helpful, please subscribe to the channel. Until next time, lighten up. It's a bit dark. Looks better. Oh my God, your lady, it looked like track. You ain't got no manicures to do today. If you want to be the bat, if you want to be professional, if you want to be award-winning, you need more RGB, LGBTQ, ABCD, EFG lighting. What the hell are you talking about now? Let me show you.
Bro, now it looks like I'm ready for Insta360 to send me a camera to review for free and tell everyone it's good, even though it is absolute 100% grade A trash. Sign up for my how to use RGB, LGBTQ, ABCD, EFG lighting master class for only 20. Okay, my congrats.